Um, <coughs> the Pasha is called Kiseitse. And it and Kiseitse means you if when and if you go out essentially what that means as we will hopefully or whatever we will cover it means that you are not hiding inside in your own what's called in your own daladamas in your own in your own environment but you have to deal with that which is outside of your own environment so the very first thing the Torah says you go out and there you will be confronted with war over your enemies. Um, this, this is a principle in general, a principle in life. Um, There are, there are different ways to deal with, with controversy, with different attitudes and different opinions and so forth. But then there is also a necessity that we have to identify when something is exactly opposite, is an oye, is an enemy. Alter Rebbe, you all learned in Tanya, explains that in every ye there are two nefoshes, there are two souls. And what this means is quite literally that the very same person can want two things and they're completely opposite to one or the other. And they cannot be reconciled. They cannot be reconciled. You know what reconciled means? No, reconciled means joined together, compromised. They're two opposites. And we have to know how to deal with these opposites. You learned in, 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 in Tanya where the Alter Rebbe explains that there is these two nefoshes, the two souls, the two sources, two souls, if I want to translate it in a more practical, a more direct fa- fashion, two sources of inspiration that a person can have. There's a source of inspiration that draws him to worldliness and within worldliness there is no limit you can draw him into that which is which is below the norm below the below the the respectable level of worldliness and then there is another source of inspiration that draws him to a completely different perspective to godliness And this is not the form we can even to discuss in the worldliness, the essence of worldliness, why is worldliness enticing and what is godliness. I just want to focus in on, on, on the words of the Pasha because, you know, generally speaking, we know what, what we're talking about. So the Alter Rebbe explains and this Pasha says it quite clearly. These first few words in the Pasha. He explains that this conflict that exists in every person between the Nefesh of Elikis and Nefesh Abamis, between the Godly inspiration and the, and the animal inspiration, these are cohabitants and the Alter Rebbe says to the extent that when a person is in the middle of davening and he has a thought coming from completely outside of the Bezameda, something completely strange, 
he should not thereby interpret that he wasn't davening properly. Because this is a stranger that's coming in and talking to him. It's not him. It was meant not him. It is the other part of him. There are literally two sources of inspiration. On the practical level, there are two sources of inspiration. How this works out and what is the total, the total situation, total truth, you know, that's not, you know, uh, possible to discuss in a, in a short form. But practically speaking, that's exactly what it is. And the enticement and inspiration and the drawing that comes from both sides, from what we call the left side and the right side, are equally powerful. The Gemara says, Kol ha-godim ha-veira yitzri godim The greater a person is, the greater one's yitzri tave is, the, more, the greater insight and the greater wisdom that a person has, he will have a correspondingly powerful yitzri hara. Which means that when you have these, these two parts of the person clash and in conflict, there is no telling who is going to be victorious. Not only there is no telling, there is actually no, no reason one one would say this one will be victorious and that one because they are, they are of equal power. The Yetzir Toiv wants godliness. Like I said, there's a source of inspiration of godliness. That is always there. A person feels elated, feels elevated, feels inspired when he thinks about pure things and, 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 greater, and, and truth and greater things. And similarly, a person is drawn and is inspired when he thinks about worldly success. I mean, it could be so vain and so empty, and yet he would he gets inspired. A person imagines <laughs> whatever he imagines a thousand people clapping for his performance. He gets inspired by it. What does he get out of it? I don't know. And he himself also doesn't know. But it, it's it's uh, really uh, elating. It's inspiring. A person can spend, spend, uh, you know, any, any amount of effort to get that applause. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever uh, aspire to that? You know, it's really funny. Like, I, I, I never really thought about it that way. Mm. See, you're not a, you're a really, a really a Sahara. <laughs> That's why you're here. I was doing more like to touch people. Right, right. See, that's a different, different story. That's why you ended up over here. <laughs> if you had really been inspired by by applause, who knows if you would be able to overcome it? I mean, it's really vain. Okay, I have a question. Already? It started the first word. So okay. <laughs> okay. Key. Why is it? If we are all going to be in this war, no? We all are at every moment. So why is it if you go out to war? Why is it not when you go out to war? Key means when. So why is everyone translated if? I also read if in the Chumash, if it translates. And if uh, it bothered me. Because I know key also means when. But they dafka chose if. Because in the simple chat in the Bosuk, it's if. In other words, you go in the Luchemas Hashus, the Kosa Mentame. It's not a Luchema that's optional. Luchemas Hashus. You know what Luchemas Hashus is? Yeah, you have <coughs> to do it. No, you don't have to do it. Luchemas Hashus. Hashus means you're not fighting an enemy or one of the seven nations that you're obligated to eradicate. Oh, okay, okay. You, you have a war for whatever other reason. So not every soldier has to go? Only who wants however, to? However the king sets it up. That depends on, okay. on the rules on the land. Okay. Okay. Right. We will come back to this, okay. to this Nochemus of Shus and so forth. But um, 
There is a Mechemes Asus also. That we'll, we'll get to it. But the Pashtas, it means when, like, like you said. Okay. In Eruchni, yeah. certainly, they, you know, we're all exposed to this war. So the Alter Rebbe explains that this is a war of equal power. And um, and uh, it's impossible to ignore, as vain and empty and meaningless the Yitzhak Haram may be, it's impossible to ignore. But it's still enticing. But it's still whatever it is. And he can't, he can't ignore it. So what's the answer? How does, you know, ultimately, how do we make the strides? How do we make progress? And the answer is, like it says in this Pasha, and the Alter Rebbe says the same thing in Tanya. That ultimately, the victory does not come from the two, from the clash of the two armies. But if you don't let go and if you fight it, Hashem will help you and He will render your enemy in your hands. And I this and I want to talk about this. The Alter Rebbe says this in Tanya, if you learned it, if you remember, when he says, that actually the war that Hashem stands by the Nefesh of the Keys to help him, it's all ready for you. Hi. To help him overcome Lishia, to help him overcome this 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 uh, uh, this battle, and the Alter the Alter explains what in what way does it help. The the assistance comes in the form what what he calls over there the Oyer Eliki, a godly light. Now, what is this godly light? And this is what the Posik says over here, when the son of Hashem Hashem will give will render him into your hand. The the nefesh, who are the keys and nefesh hativis, the natural nefesh abamis, they have desires. A, a person has a natural inclination, a natural um, <coughs> appreciation and enjoyment of Ruchnius, of godliness, and likewise enjoyment lahavdul in in the world of things, and they are equal. Where are they not equal? And say Hashem stands by. That is that when it comes to an enormous of godliness, in addition to it being enticing, in addition to it being something that that we appreciate, we and we enjoy, there is another totally different ingredient. That is, that we also recognize that this is the truth. This is not merely something that I like, or a personal nature, or a personal choice type. This is something which is really true, the truth. The principle of truth in this context, in the godly context, <coughs> is completely is a completely different concept, and I'll discuss this, than what we call truth in the world. If someone, two people come in front of a judge, One claims he owes me a hundred dollars. The other one says, "No, I don't owe you any." Right? Simply dispute. So then he goes out and he brings witnesses, or it is a document or whatever proof he has that attests that he is correct, that he is right. So the judge looks at his document or he listens to the witnesses and says, "Ah." Oh, you owe him $100, or you don't owe him $100, whatever the judgment is. 
on the basis of the proof that he presented. Excuse me. Now, after the proof has been presented and they have verified on that basis that yes, the situation is such, this is only proof that came that this verification, pardon me, this verification that he owes him hundred dollars is only based on proof, which means it, he could still have, he could still owe him or not owe him, but we have proved that he owes him. It is not something that is compelling, self-compelling, that for sure he has to owe him hundred dollars. It's not self-evident. It's, we have, it's, a, it's something that's being proven through some means. It's not something that one readily identifies as being the truth. There's a completely different level of truth. This is what we call the godly truth. We mentioned several times in these talks that which the Rambam says, that the basis, he saw it how he said this way in the beginning, that the basis of all knowledge is to know that there is a first being that creates everything. Now, how are you going to know that there's a first being that, if you don't learn, if you don't have knowledge, how are you going to know that there's a first being that creates everything? How do you know that? What's the answer? The answer is that this principle knowledge that is, is of such clarity, such a degree of, of of um, certainty, of clarity, that it really does not need to be learned. It does not need to be proven. Because the human intelligence, the human mind, as such, when he observes um, a, a living, enter the living world, he immediately sees that this is not something that came by accident, he sees there was something, some, there was a source that made it. It's not a question of proof. It's a question of really of observation. Just as, I've used this simple illustration, that if you enter a hall, a, a, a catering hall, and you see tables set up, and chairs and servings and place placemats and all that. You know that there is something being celebrated. Nobody has to tell it to you. Why? Because what you are observing is exactly that celebration. You are actually seeing it. The same thing is in the observation when you have a step back. A cat will walk into there. He will not see a celebration. He will either, either see meat or he won't see meat, but he won't see a celebration. It's the human intelligence that recognizes something that is less corporeal, something that is not just being told and being proven, but, some, but, the, but he, he, he recognizes the, the spirit behind that which he observes. And that's how he's, he's certain. Beyond question, he doesn't need any proof. The same thing is this knowledge. To the human mind, one stops and, and, and what, we, what the Rebbe calls thinks with his, the, the true power of his intelligence, the true, what's called the objective intelligence, he will readily see this truth. He doesn't need any proof of it. The problem, the difficulty that we have is because our intelligence is being clouded. And we, we don't, we're not permitted to, to look at things with our, with our clear mind. But the clear mind, the clear human mind sees it directly. That doesn't need any proof.
This is the type of truth that we're referring to when we talk about the godly truth. It is not a truth that needs proof, because a truth that needs proof does not really present itself as a truth. You just know that it's true, but it itself does not really influence you. The Rambam says a very interesting thing. Moshe Rabbeinu led the Jewish people for 40 years in the desert and performed numerous miracles. Right? Numerous miracles. I'm not looking to you, I'm looking to your brother. You know the story, right? You all know that Moshe led the Jewish people for 40 years and performed tremendous miracles in the desert. Right. And yet, the Rambam says that when the Jewish people ultimately accepted the Torah from Moshe and accepted his guidelines, his guiding hand in how they should set up their lives, it was not on the basis of any of these miracles. Didn't say, oh, Moshe Rabbeinu said you should keep Shabbos, or we better believe him. Hashem wants you to keep Shabbos. Or we better believe him, because look, he, he's proven that he did miracles. Hashem must have been talking to him. That wasn't the basis. Because this means that you know that he is telling the truth indirectly. Not directly. And that's not, that's not sufficient. Because whenever you have what's called indirect proof, there is the Yetzir Hora that comes from the other side and says, well, I have indirect proof of something else. I once mentioned here, I'm sure you all remember from recently, that there was this... Um, there was a meeting one time, one time a meeting, a get together between the Rebbe Rashab. The Rebbe Rashab, the Rashab, the, the, the previous Rebbe's father, the one who started the Ten Chetmim, the Yeshiva Ten Chetmim. He had a distant cousin who was, who was, uh, who strayed off the path completely. He lived in Svat, no? Huh? He lived in Svat? He lived in Svat, no. He lived in Europe. And he was, he, he was, he, he wrote, he was, he wrote literature and all that. He was known as a Chadha by the pen. <clears throat> and uh, he was a very learned, very, very smart man. And he also learned Torah. I mean, he was what's called Sonu Pirish. He was an yeshiva and a big scholar. And then he, he strayed off the path. This was in the time of the Enlightenment movement. There was a tremendous pressure from all kinds of different things, uh, you know, from the scholars, quote unquote, from the secular scholarships, and um, um, he, he he got caught in there. So then they met one time, and um, after they spent whatever period of time, an hour together, each made a comment about the other one what their impression is of the other. So the Rebbe Rashab said about the Hanaam that he, if he should stand by the, by the, by the Red Sea and he should watch Moshe Rabbeinu lift his staff and smite the waters and the waters split and the Jewish people walk across, walk on into the waters. And the Egyptians follow them. And the water fall right back on the Egyptians. And they even walk across, in, not only in safety, but in glory, in dry, and you know, all kinds of things like the Medrash explains the whole gold, thing. Gold and silver and, and, and diamonds and fruit, all kinds of different things that they, that they encountered on their path across, across this, um, the, 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 this um, in, in the depth of the sea. 
he would remain the same Apicoides. That's what the letter said. It wouldn't budge him. He would remain the same Apicoides. How is that possible? How is it possible? He sees it. The answer is that if you lose touch with your soul and you see things exclusively by logical proof then nothing will touch you unless it fits into your model of what logical proof is what world is he won't be able to accept it and at the last resort, when you cannot explain it in any other way, he says, well, you know, I'm not smart enough. Eventually, somebody will come out and be able to explain it. And that will be enough to nullify everything that you observed. Why? Because you don't have a direct connection. You don't, you don't really connect to the truth of what you see. If one loses touch with his neshama, to see things the way the Nishoma sees things, then nothing will help him. And this is what the Torah says, that when the Yitzhak Toiv confronts the Yitzhak Hora, the nephew, the godly soul confronts the Nefer Zabam, is the animal soul. There is a, a, an insight, a certain power, that the Nefesh Olikis has over and above the Nefesh Abahams. And that is that it recognizes that this which I see, and this which I identify as godliness, is not just something which I experience, something that I like, something that, that makes me feel good, but this is a truth, an undeniable truth. This is what's called the Oireliki, the godly light, which does not need substantiation, does not need proof, does not need even further elaboration or anything. This is what you, what you recognize. And this is the power that, that renders, what renders means gives over, sub, you know, submits to us our enemy. And that this is what the Torah says. You go out to war, you have to understand. So me? Beyond logic. The Mesidus Nefesh is rooted in this. This is not Mesidus Nefesh. This is something that you actually experience. Hmm. But because of this, we are able to, we have, we have the power of Mesidus Nefesh, because of this insight. Hashem renders the enemy into your hand. This is how you overcome the enemy. What happens as a result of this? One would ask, why did I need this whole struggle for? Why do I need an enemy for? If I if I have the Nefesh I have this God, this soul. So that should be sufficient. Why do I need to, to fight the enemy? Why am I confronted with an enemy? Which is a question that we discuss many times over here. Because every one of us here has a kasha. Why was it that I was exposed to, uh, to, to complete opposite to complete opposite ideas, opposite views, that which completely confused my, my pure and clear view of, of, of life, of truth. What did I what did it need it for? What did it happen? And then Hashem comes and helps me to overcome it. Hashem could have prevented it from the begin with, that I shouldn't be exposed, I shouldn't have to have go through this battle. 
and for this the Torah says no there is a great benefit that you will gain out of it what is the great benefit it says right there in the post the Shoviso Shivya what does Shoviso Shivya mean you will the Shoviso you will take huh no, but Shavisa means you will cap, you will take captive. You will, you will take capt, you will, you will capture, you will take captive. But it does not say you will take captive them, your enemy. It says you will take captive Shivio, his captives. That which was captive by your enemy you will now release them and you will take them captive to yourself. You will, what is this? What is this implying? What is this about? So, we will talk first the way it is pertaining to us and then we will see how this translates in the Posik itself. What is explained on this in terms of Avodah Hashem is that we have to know that all that the Nefesh Habamis, the animal soul, and the Yitzhahara, and all evil in the world, everything draws its sustenance ultimately from Godliness. Nothing exists independently of Godliness. Except that it is there, the godly spark, so to speak, in, in the creepy, in the impure world, is captive. It doesn't function in its own way, the way it wants. It's captive. I'll give you an illustration of Jewish history. Not so far back, going back was even more. In the in a Polish society, going back, let's say, a hundred years ago, there were these landowners, landlords. Uh, they were known as counts, very wealthy. They were they owned huge uh, areas, cities, in the whole counties. And they were what's called, you know, a complete, had complete jurisdiction over, over the land and complete jurisdiction over all the people that lived there. So it is known that these very wealthy, and the, the, these powerful lords and counts always used to have what they called a moshke. You know what a moshke is? They called the Jew by the name Moshe, huh? Moshe. Because the Jews, they were referred to as Moshe Rabbeinu's Talmidi, Moshe Rabbeinu's followers. They called them Moshe. Why did they need a Moshe? Because this Moshe was the wise person. He was the one who was able to give him direction, was able to answer his questions and give him advice on whatever questions that came up, whether it be personal um, whether it be competition with his, with, in competition with, with, with other uh, uh, lords, or uh, in terms of entertainment, the Moshe would come up whenever this, this count would, would sit with his friends and drink away, he would call his Moshe that he should entertain them. And the Moshe would come up and he would entertain them. He would, he would tell them stories. <laughs> he would, he would, uh, um, they sing for them, dance for them, whatever it is. So this this was the yid, this wise yid. So he was using all his talent, all his God blessed talent that the yid has. But he wasn't using it in the way that he would like to use it. He was using it as a captive of this guy 
who have absolutely no understanding of what what the Yid is, what, what the Moshki is. And he would, he would he completely abuse him. But this is but the situation is that Abishtan has, has put Yidin on the day of rule and this is how Yidin lived for, for, for centuries. The same thing is true in, in all evil. There is a goddess part of Shivyoi. There is good in, there is a goddess part in all evil. And the point, the point and the purpose of this struggle is Vishavisa Shivi, is to withdraw and draw out from the, from the evil power to draw out the captive, the god, the god despite that's captive within it, and to draw it back into Kedusha and to elevate it and bring it back into Kedusha. So this is the way it is explained in Chesides, in Kabbalah. Now I want to speak about it in something close to us in more practical terms, how this actually translates in our own lives. The first thing that we can readily recognize that after that a person goes through the struggle where where at first it was as you said an equal battle. He likes he likes godliness and he also likes worldliness. And it was an equal battle. So then Whichever path he chooses, his choice does not exclude the possibility of him the next time choosing something else. Because he hasn't really made the decision, he hasn't really made a, a conclusive choice that this is the truth, this is the path that I want. This is the only truth, the other is not true. After he goes through this battle <coughs> and he recognizes that, that this battle is being won because, because of the godly truth that they are in. Hashem has rendered him. It's not something that, oh, today I chose this way, tomorrow I'll choose something else. This is the truth, the truth that doesn't change. Today, yesterday, tomorrow, it's the same truth. Then he comes to a point where it's no longer a question of a, of a choice. Now I like this, tomorrow I like this. He, he, he comes to a point where he gets a clear view of what his path in life is. He no longer hesitates, no longer <coughs> wobbles, no longer doubts. He has a clear view of his path. Because the, the, the other side is no longer a challenge to the truth that he has recognized. What this means in, 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 you know, in terms of avoider, it means that one has actually overcome, one has actually nullified the power of the, of the, of the impurity to the point where he says, it's not, in, it's not enticing. Why? Because there's a greater truth and a greater value which is beyond any that beyond any interest that this can that this can can possibly present to me. You this, you reach a level where he has no chesed to do anything wrong, or he just, no, it's clear in his mind what he needs to do. No, that's right. To no chesed, he still has a chesed, but it's not a challenge anymore. It's not a question of. Okay, I have a cheshit, I have a desire to do this. Maybe I should do it. You understand? Know Who knows? Maybe this, is, maybe this is the source of success. Why here? Ah. He has no sign, no question about that. He knows that's MS and that's fun. But that's right. But, but this, the, it's no longer confusing to him. He's no longer captive. 
that he can possibly be actually drawn in. Yeah, it's still possible he was sometimes fair, but he knows that this is insignificant. This is, in no way is he going to choose that path in life. Because Hashem Alekecho, Hashem has given, has rendered, because he waged the war, this is the whole thing, because he says it on the whole, because he waged the war, he didn't give in. Hashem, then it, it was it became obvious to him on which side Hashem is, where the truth is. And once he recognizes where the truth is, there's no way that he is going to fall away elsewhere. And this is ultimately the great benefit of this war. This is expressed in various ways, but one most commonly quoted uh, saying is actually from the Gemara itself, what the Gemara says, Mokim Shabbat Shuva Oimdim Tzadikim Gemurim Ein Oimdim Ein Yechoyim Lamed However the, the version is that the place where Tzadikim Shuva stand Tzadikim cannot stand Why not Tzadikim? Tzadikim were never impure so how why can they stand there? Tzadikim are fakers? You have questions about what's MS and what's not? They haven't they haven't no they don't have any questions about MS so The thing they? is the difference is this Before a person has been has been challenged, a tzaddik does not necessarily know he was not because he wasn't challenged. <coughs> Therefore, I'm talking about an ordinary tzaddik, not the tzaddik, you know, the, the excluded, the, the exceptional, an ordinary person who was not challenged because he was never challenged. He does not know clearly his own mind whether what he likes Torah. He goes into the Torah because he recognizes it's truth but beca- or because he likes it. He doesn't know it yet. It hasn't been, it hasn't been proven to him. And it's possible to come to him and convince him, hey, how do you know it's true? Maybe you just like it. And he, first then he's going to start digging him and have to battle it. And the Baal Tshuva, he is the one who is the who who has broken through this, and even even to the extent of coming back from a completely different viewpoint, and being able to stand up and recognize and have a source of of chayus, a source of strength, from knowing from knowing this is the truth. The world is still enticing. Like you said, you know, you don't have a desire. Yes, the world is still enticing. He's too concerned. Okay, so where's a thousand people? Where's my applause and all that? <laughs> that stusim is still there. But, but he also has a completely different strength with which to, to confront it. And the, the Posuk says, it's an interesting thing, since the time is almost up, so I just want to point out that this is actually pointed out in the Pasha clearly. Because Rashi says, if you remember Rashi, what Rashi says, Vishaviso Shivyoi. Rashi says that ordinarily people from the, from the seven nations, you cannot take a captive. Right, the seven nations, you can, you either, either they run away from you, they go away elsewhere, not, they can't live with you, either they go away, or they convert, or, they, or, or you have to kill them. You can't make partnership with them, you can't take them, take them captive. <coughs> Other nations you can take captive if you want, but not from the seven nations. But if you have, if you wage war with someone, with another nation, and they have captives from the seven nations, you're allowed to take them. That's what he said, the they, was, they had captives of the seven nations, you're allowed to take them. What is the point which, which they, what this implies? What does this tell us? This tells us that 
once you wage this war and and you recognize that Hashem, Hashem gave it to you, then you are no longer scared even of these people. You, in other words, you are, you are assured you, you can take even that which is further out in Kalipa and elevate even that, which normally you wouldn't be able to do. Um, I want to take up now in a few minutes that I left another part from the Parsha which is also extremely revealing and instructive to us and that is the, the whole Indian of Kelayim. You know what Kelayim means? Kelayim means, means mixing different species. But it does not necessarily mean <coughs> in, in reproductive fashion. Because, for instance, we can't mix wool and linen. If you take wool and linen and you weave them all, both <coughs> into the same cloth, in the same garment, we are not allowed to wear it. But you didn't, you didn't really change the wool and linen. Nothing happened. You didn't allow to. The same thing, a similar union, where you, you're allowed to take two animals, two different species of animals, particularly if one is a kosher animal, one is not a kosher animal. Like, Shoyer Vachamoy, the Torah says, a ox and a donkey. <coughs> And, and saddle them, attach them to the same wagon, and pull the wagon together, he's not allowed to. And several other things of a similar fashion where the Torah insists that we keep things separate. Huh? It's like a hookah. Shatnas, it says, my favorite is a hookah. In the other case, in the case of the animal, um, you know, there is some sense, some idea that we can explain. They have different natures and different uh, inclinations, and you, you're causing them pain, even though it's also a little bit far-fetched. But sharpness, you mix wool and linen, <laughs> who suffers by it? You're mixing two huh? What about the seed of the fruit? In the seed of the fruit, right. In the seed of the fruit, there is some sense of an explanation. You take two fruit, two different kinds of fruit, and you transplant them, cross, cross breed them, cross plant them. You're creating a new species of fruit, which is not, which is different than what Hashem created. So you're kind of mix, mixing something up. But here you're not doing anything. And the trader, the trader insists that we have to keep it separate. Um, <clears throat> what is this principle? Particularly, what principle do I want, do want to focus in over here? On the one hand, the trader says, we have to keep everything in its own line, everything has to be separate. In its line, the way Hashem created it. <coughs> Similarly, <coughs> excuse me, um, by the tribes, when even came out of Mitzrayim, immediately, upon coming out of Mitzrayim, they were divided along the lines of the tribes, of the Shvati. Ruben, Shim, and Levi, all the separate tribes. When they sat, when they, as they were traveling in the desert, they were identified separately. It's one nation. Why do you have to separate them? When they entered at Israel, each shevet was given its own its own stretch of land. Aren't you creating creating a potential for animosity, potential of for um, 
um, um, competition unnecessarily. What is the, the what is the, what is the Torah teaching us? The Torah is teaching us one simple principle. Because, um, step back a minute. Uh, because, uh, on the other hand, this kind of seems to be contradicting the principle of Shema Yisrael Hashem Alkin Hashem Echad. That everything is one. And that Jewish nation is all one. We have to Lereyacha Komeicha. And there is no difference whether he is of your shevet or not. And which reacho? He says everyone. The Baal Shem Tov said that reacho reacho komecho applies and pertains even to a Jew that you've never seen and you don't even know he exists. He is in some place on the other side of the globe. And, 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 and you have a, a, a love for him. So on the one hand, the Torah is saying you have to keep everything separate the way Hashem created. On the other hand, we say we have to unify everything. What is the principle here? The principle is <clears throat> that yes, indeed, we have to unify. But we have to remember that unification is the result of the godly presence. We unify because God unites everything, not because we eliminate boundaries. We don't break any boundaries that Hashem has created. This is, this is the principle that we have, um, you know, men and women completely separate, and not only, is it, I mean, separate and completely, they completely different functions and different instructions, different and, and responsibilities. And um, um, everyone has to recognize, everyone as an individual, there's an interesting emphasis, both in Kriya Shema and in the Aserah Sadibris, in Ten Commandments. In Aserah Sadibris, Hashem revealed Himself to the entire Jewish people as one. And what did He say? Onoichi Hashem Eloikecha. In singular form. He didn't say it in plural, Hashem Eloikechem. He said it in singular form, Hashem Eloikecha. The same thing in, Sh- in Shema Yisrael. We start saying Hashem Eloikechnu, our God, and then we say, We are half to us, Hashem Eloikecha, which is in singular. Every individual person has the capacity and has the responsibility and has the koichis, the ability to recognize the truth, the godly truth, individually by himself. And it is necessary that he recognize it. He has to know that he has his own responsibility as an individual and his own ability to reveal and build his life around the principles of truth, the principles of goodness and righteousness and toil. Of course he has to unite with others, but that comes after. After he recognizes that the world belongs to God, then he recognizes, oh, we're all one under God. But to start with, he has to know his own, his own mind, his own path. And this is, in fact, a very important antidote to what we spoke about before. I don't, I don't mean you, believe me. Um, we, start, we get all excited about a thousand applauses where we say that my whole mitzvah, my whole 
to know who am I, what, what identifies me as an important being. Oh, I have a thousand people attesting that I'm a, that I'm, that I'm a great performer. That makes you? No. First, you have to have your own values. You have to have your own values that Hashem gave you as an individual. Then, if you have something to contribute to others, fine. But to say that the world is what makes you, that's, that's, that's the opposite of Kedusha, the opposite of truth. This is why, why the Torah teaching is in, in, in all kinds of different ways that every, each individual has to have his own path, his own life, his own responsibility. <clears throat> and then when he recognizes Hashem's presence in his life, then of course he joins in with others. This, these, this principle and these principles which are actually very closely interrelated, this is the source of strength and the source of success. I'm sure I don't have to go and elaborate, but simply put, everyone recognize that if he does not find his own truth, does not and does not follow the truth as he sees it, he is just floating in nothingness. And it may be for the moment his Yitzhar Hara is enjoying it, but it's a meaningless enjoyment. It's leading nowhere. Everyone has to know that Hashem gave him his own Hashem, his own struggles, and his own strength to overcome his struggles. It doesn't mean that he has to do it without help, but he has. But when he gets help, he has, he has to do it. When he gets advice, when he learns, and so forth. When the son of Hashem alokechot biyodecho, Hashem gives you, gives him, renders him into your hand. But you go out to war. You have to wage the war. You have to make every effort to find it, to find the strength and find to know how to do it. This is the source of success. And this is the only way that we can build our lives and build our homes. It means we can duplicate. We can be imitators. We have every person Every person is a new world. And the Mishnah says, I'm kind, never shahas me. So one who, who saves, who, who sustains one soul by him, he sustains the whole world. Because everyone is a whole world, new world. And he has to know that he has to build his own world. Build his own world means he has to find his own truth. He has to find his own clarity, a clear path. And that's what you build. But, and building his own world does not mean just in terms of supporting himself financially. That's that's insignificant. It is to, every person said the Mishnah says, the Yamada says, ain't they say I'm shovis. No two people think exactly alike. And everyone is a contributor to the entire spectrum of, of Jewish life. Everyone is a contributor. The Rebbe has insisted that everyone has to be a mashpia and a matam. Which means to be a mashpia means that he has to have a clarity of vision on his own to teach others. This is the source of blessing. Hashem will bless you all that you should first in one in yeshiva, gain this clarity of vision, gain that, that strength, and meet Hashem, build your homes on solid and, and, and foundations. And never be confused by the enemy. And I wish you should have 10,000 of